Now it is my pleasure to introduce Marty Bonick, Chief Executive Officer at Arden Health Services. Marty will share insights into the impact of workplace culture on patient experiences gleaned from his own personal patient journey. Please welcome a friend, Marty Bonick. Thanks Vaughn for that kind introduction. It's great to be here this morning with the Modern Healthcare audience. And today I have with me Amanda Armstrong from our Marketing and Communications Department. And I wanna talk a little bit about the healthcare journey that I went on and what I learned about that in terms of how it affects workplace culture. Yeah, so Marty, certainly as Arden's CEO, you have one perspective on workplace culture, but as you mentioned, you have your own personal healthcare journey. So as a patient, let's start there if you wanna take us back to where that started. Sure. Um, I'm a triathlete and I was uh, going on a training ride with my friends as I often do. We live in Nashville, Tennessee and we have a great road called the Natchez Trice Parkway which is usually a, a cycling haven for people on the weekends, uh, at least most times. Um, and we were setting off on a training ride. Um, the four of us were uh, training for an Ironman later in the fall last year and this was uh, September 11th, 2021. And we were setting out to ride 100 miles on the, in the Natchez Trice and as things happened, we tend to get separated from each other. It's a long ride, and so we'll have checkpoints. We always have a plan when we set off, and we'll have a checkpoint in terms of where to, where to stop and meet up and regroup if we get separated. So it started off a, a nice fall morning. It was a little bit cool, a little bit crisp, but the sun started coming up, and uh, things started warming up, and as, as things happen, one of us got separated. Um, in this case, I got separated and got ahead of our group, and I got to our 80-mile checkpoint just about noon in uh, the Saturday afternoon. And um, at that point, um, I was gonna have to do a U-turn um, and, and sort of stop and wait for, our, for the rest of my cycling team to catch up to me. And so as I was doing that, I looked behind me and I didn't see anybody, I didn't hear anybody. And so I slowly started to make this uh, U-turn in, in the road. Problem was, it was a bit of a blind corner and in a few seconds from when I started to make that turn to actually getting halfway through that turn, I looked and there was this car coming right at me. Um, it, it, everything sort of froze like it was in slow motion. Um, and it, the reality was, a, was just a split second uh, that was happening. And so I had to make a decision. I could either try to get back in my lane or I can try to get off to the other side where I saw this big grassy area. And so that's what I decided to do. The problem was I didn't have a lot of momentum going. And so I had to start pedaling again. And so I, I took that first pedal and, and looked at that car and it started getting closer uh, towards me. Um, I can see the lady that was driving, she can see me. We probably both looked like deer in the headlights at the time. Um, took another pedal stroke and it looked like all of a sudden she was gonna curve away from me. And so I'm like, I'm gonna be okay. And then another second later, she starts to turn right at me. And, and as I later found out, there's a phenomenon called target fixation where your, your body does the opposite thing of what your brain's telling it to do. And she instinctively targeted me instead of moving away. And so it was that point that I realized I was gonna get hit. Um, now, a lot of people have those life flash before you types of experiences. And I really didn't have that for whatever reason. I thought I was gonna be okay, um, but I knew I was gonna get hit. And, and sure enough, that car hit me uh, pretty much a straight T-bone. And uh, at that moment, um, I remember it, um, that I went flying in the air. Uh, the lady was driving about 55 miles an hour when she hit me, and I flew about 75 feet in the air. And so, uh, aftermath of all of this, you can see my body imprint on the hood of the car, and my helmet cracked her windshield, but uh, you know, I'm thankful to God that I'm here today because he put me on the right path, and I didn't have any major, major uh, trauma that I couldn't get past. Um, for a split second, the adrenaline was going. I thought I was going to actually be able to walk away from this, but uh, as, as luck would turn out, that wasn't the case. Um, I was quickly uh, greeted by some uh, uh, bypassers that were coming down, uh, Good Samaritans, and one of them happened to be a, a retired EMT. Uh, he saw me, but as I was trying to put weight down on this arm, I said, ow, it turns out this, this shoulder was dislocated. Try to put this this arm down, and turns out this this collarbone was broken. Um, and I realized I wasn't going to get up, and, and he was able to stabilize me and wait with me until the ambulance got there. Um, but I realized I ended up having a broken sternum, a couple of cracked ribs, a pneumothorax, which is why it was so hard to breathe at the time, and a, and a pretty uh, you know severe bruise on my my leg and thigh or uh, thigh and ankle. And so pretty traumatic experience, but I was okay. And I remember it all just like it happened yesterday. Um, and I knew I was gonna be okay, but, but this was gonna turn into a healthcare journey for me. That's 
massive in terms of experiencing that. Your group catches up with you. Yeah. Um, they're documenting this. It's why you have these pictures of the event. The ambulance arrives, you get loaded into the ambulance. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I mean, one of my friends that I was riding with is an attorney, so like a good attorney, he was uh, taking pictures of everything, and that's why I was able to sort of piece this story together in my mind after the fact. But uh, yeah, uh, this is for the first time in my life, um, you know, most people don't see this as an opportunity, but for me as a healthcare administrator, I was gonna be a patient for the first time in my you know, adult existence. And um, from everything of being loaded onto a backboard and looking up in an ambulance, staring with your head strapped down, being in pain, not knowing where you're at, where you're going, um, you know, really you realize how dependent you are on caregivers and your life is literally in their hands and, and they're putting their, their life um, in your way to help you to, to make sure that that's a good experience. So they got me in the ambulance. It was about an hour and a half ride to the trauma center because we were pretty far south outside of the city at that point and um, got to the ER and then they were able to confirm you know, all of the injuries that I had, but fortunately there was no major head trauma, no major spinal damage. Um, I was gonna be okay, but uh, I was gonna have an experience to endure as we went forward. And so you're starting to meet the people um, that are part of your healthcare journey experience from the people that are in the ambulance to the people that are in the ER. You're eventually admitted into a room. So in terms of kind of transitioning into what you just went through that was traumatic and now I'm a patient, I'm in this hospital. Um, how are you starting to pick up on things and the people around you, how you were being cared for versus the environment? Yeah, so the, the people were wonderful. Um, this, this happened on September 11th uh, last year. This was the peak of the, the Delta variant in Nashville. Um, I'm pretty sure that the only patients in the hospital at the time were COVID patients or trauma patients as uh, I can hear all the helicopters flying in. And so the people were really stretched thin. They were stressed. All of our caregivers are working so hard, but they were wonderful. They made me feel like I was the only patient in the room at the time and I was the only person that they had to care for. And despite everything else that they were having to deal with behind the scenes, they made me that focus and center of attention, which was wonderful. You know, as long as I've been in this business, um, we hear and think about the patient experience and we've got to have a cleaner room or a bigger room or newer furniture or, or you know, renovations and all these things. And that's important, um, but it's not what I remember from that experience. Um, the room that I was in was probably one of the smallest hospital rooms I've ever been in. And I've probably been in and out of 100 plus hospitals in my career. Um, there was barely enough room for my wife to have a chair to sit next to me. But, but that's, not what's, that would, that's not what mattered to me. That's not what was important. I remember that care. And, and even though I saw different faces between aides and techs and x-ray technicians, phlebotomists, uh, nurses, doctors, um, I, I felt like I rarely saw the same people twice. They were working as a team. They were taking care of me and making sure that my needs were met and, and sort of took a lot of the other things that, that I historically thought about in terms of the patient experience out and just realized it's about the people at the end of the day. And you were at a facility, not an Arden facility, because we don't have one in the Nashville area, but they were also an Epic facility. Yes. So Arden has integrated Epic across our entire company over the last few years. You had to have been, once you kind of got past, like, here's where I am, yeah. pretty interested in how this was going to work from an Epic perspective. So what was that like? Yeah, no, we, we, we have Epic across all 200 plus sites of our care and our patients love it. I was so looking forward to be able to, to look at it once I sort of came to and I downloaded the app on my phone uh, and unfortunately I couldn't get in. Um, turns out my wife had given her email address at registration and I was trying to register with my email address so it didn't work. So I wasn't able to actually get to experience it in the hospital. Um, but when I finally did get there, I was really looking forward to the opportunity of being able to see my chest x-ray results and test results and all the things that were done to me in the hospital um, and be able to schedule online appointments and pay my bills and do all these things that I've got to learn about Epic. It's a great system. But in this instance, unfortunately, the only thing I had from an entire four-day length of stay in the hospital was one single chest x-ray. Um, so something w was amiss, but uh, it was just really an opportunity lost. I mean, you know, as systems, we spend you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars implementing these electronic medical records. And if they don't work when the patients go to them, then we're, we're missing that opportunity for a connection point to make their experience better in the moment, but also to stay in touch with them longitudinally through their care journey. And, I did not have that experience, unfortunately, with this system, um, and really just a, a you know an opportunity missed. I'm a very technological savvy person, mm -hmm. very wired in, um, and was really looking forward to be able to interact with the healthcare system through through that system, and, and unfortunately, it just didn't work. We've talked about people, technology, 
processes are all also really important to not only your patient experience but a workplace so after you were discharged from the hospital what was your experience at, at that point yeah so you know it it's always feels good to get out of the hospital uh, but i knew i was going to have to have some follow-up um, my collarbone was was broken um, in two and it was going to have to be surgically put back together uh, so, you know, I got an appointment with the orthopedic surgeon and uh, they were great, but they said we need an MRI so we know exactly how to put the bone back together and make sure it works. So, had an MRI before, no problem. That should be a simple, easy procedure. And usually it is, but uh, in this instance, as I was trying to register, um, there was a problem with the insurance preauthorization. And, um, you know, as we're going through the front desk, you know, I'm talking to them and like, I work in healthcare, I know how this works. What can I do to help? And they said, well, we're trying to get an authorization. We have an inpatient authorization. We don't have an authorization for the MRI. And I said, okay. And so, you know, minutes are going by, 30, 45 minutes at this point. I'm like, okay, what can I do to help? And so I call my insurance company directly, I call the back of the number. And the good news is they said, you don't need an insurance uh, authorization for an MRI for your procedure. And I said, great, can I put you on speakerphone? Hold that up to the, to the receptionist. And they're like, okay, that's great, but our insurance verification office is in another location and we can't fix it from here. And so another hour goes by. At this point, I'm pulling out my credit card and saying, just, I'll pay for it. Let me get this because I'm in pain. I need to have this procedure. I wanted to go home and get my pain medicine. And they couldn't take my credit card because if they took that, then that means they couldn't go back and bill insurance after the fact. And so one thing after another, um, you know, just opportunities missed. As I think about that experience, you know, compared to other things that I interact with, uh, we all have one of these phones. I've got a, a, a wallet on my phone. I can find movie tickets. I can have my credit card. I can do all these things. Why can't my insurance card be on there? And why can't I just tap a button? And it's all there and, and people can see what my benefits are. I mean, this is where healthcare really has fallen down and really not service, servicing the patient. So finally get my MRI. Um, that went well, the procedure, once I got past the, the registration hassles and hurdles. Um, had my surgery, that also went well. Great caregivers once again, um, very efficient, knew what they were doing, got me in, got me out. Um, and then it was time to schedule follow-up PT. And so time to get back to getting past the limp that I had in my leg and, and start walking again. Um, and, and that was a great experience to start because they actually had an online schedule. So I was able to set that first appointment online. Like this is, this is gonna get better um, until I showed up in the office. You know, I, I'd spent time, I filled out my information on the portal. Um, I get there and they said, okay, here's a clipboard. You need to fill this out. I said, wait, 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 I, I've already done this. I, I filled out my information on the portal. You know, can't we get started? No, I'm sorry, you've got to fill it out. And so back to filling out the clipboards, name, address, you know, date of birth, social security number, flip the page, name, address, social security, date of birth. You know, also we can then scan these papers back into a computerized system at the mm -hmm. end of the day. And so it's just like we, we, we have these processes uh, but we just fail to connect the dots and given the technology that should be available to us. And so, again, once, the, once I got through that, um, the, the care was wonderful. But then every time I had to come back, because I was going back several times a week, I had to play calendar Jenga with the receptionist. And how do we get an appointment? I would like a morning appointment so I could do this on my way into work. Well, I'm sorry, we can't do that. How about 11 a.m.? Like, I start work a little bit earlier than that. <laughs> so, you know, we go back and forth and we play these games why can't you just tell me what your availability is? You know, I can book a haircut from my phone right now and just say, I can do 9 a.m. Uh, but why can't we do that in healthcare? I think we can, the answer is we're not. And so I think those are the opportunities. And so these are the things that I got to experience. Wonderful care throughout, but, but just frustrating processes and lack of technology and resources to make the experience something that is tolerable when you're already in pain and, and suffering in your own ways. Right, it was not only frustrating for you, I'm sure it was frustrating for the caregivers, for the people at registration. Yeah. They've got old processes that they have to keep following. You've got a new mantra here at Ardent, you know, no more clipboards. So really looking at bridging that digital gap and really creating greater opportunities and connections Telehealth has been something that has been, you know, obviously huge since uh, COVID-19 and, and really forced that issue. So what were your opportunities with telehealth in this process? Yeah, it's, uh, I did get to experience it, but not in the way that I had thought. Um, good points. As I was leaving the hospital, uh, the trauma team says, you've got to have an appointment uh, 10 days after your visit, uh, after your discharge, which is understandable, but um, they didn't ask me. They gave me an appointment card. Your, your appointment's at Wednesday at 2 p.m. Turns out I was unavailable at Wednesday at 2 p.m., but they never asked me to begin with, is that time 
the time and appointment convenient for you, they just handed me a card. Um, so while the, the reminders were not through Epic, I did get a text message and it says you have an appointment coming up on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Can you, you know, yes to confirm, R to reschedule or C to cancel? I said, okay, I'll hit R to reschedule. And so I get a message back and it says, would you like to schedule a telehealth visit instead? Great, why wasn't that offered to begin with? That would have been the preferred way. I wouldn't have to navigate the parking lots and the hallways to try to find this office in a crowded medical complex. Yes, I'd be happy to do that. So I get the reply back and it says, okay, please call this number to reschedule. It's like, okay, we were getting so close here to having that experience, but we still missed. So after three rounds of, of talking to the scheduler because they didn't have a telehealth appointment as an option in their scheduling system, so they had to converse back and forth with the doctor's office, finally was able to get that telehealth visit scheduled. Now, the day that it happened, they were running 45 minutes behind, and we all know that people get busy. Um, I understand that, uh, and at least I was able to be sitting in my office at, at, at my workplace and be getting work done while I was there versus sitting in a waiting room having my time neglected. They offered to reschedule me for an appointment with my original provider, but I think I'd already only seen my original provider once, and so I said, I don't want to reschedule again. I'll, I'll go on with the visit. So three phone calls and apologies later, finally had that visit. Turned out to be five minutes with a provider that didn't know me, really didn't know my background, but clearly can tell that I was on the road to recovery and I didn't need to be part of the trauma ser service anymore, so they discharged me. So 45 minutes of, of waiting for my time, five-minute phone call, and a $190 bill. That's the type of service that we're giving right now. And yes, technically, all of the, the billing requirements were met, but did they value my time? Did they value my input into that process? Or did they even think about me at all in that process? And it was more care given on their terms and their convenience versus mine as the patient who's ultimately paying the bill. So are you starting to think about this from a CEO perspective? Like, I wonder how we're doing things, if this is how I'm experiencing it. And if so, how is that you know, really further impacting not only our patients, but our people. Yeah. Now, as again, this, this has been a wake up call for me. Um, you know, this, this moment of impact has turned into an opportunity really to think about how do we put the consumer at the center of everything that we're doing? Uh, and not just the patient, um, but also our caregivers. Um, our caregivers are the one that have to put up with this broken technology or lack of processes um, or apologizing to patients for the, 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 the frustrations that we cause them. Our caregivers don't want that, and that contributes to the burnout that they're experiencing. And so for me, this has really been a, a wake-up call and an experience in terms of we have to change the way in which we do things, not just for our patients, but for our caregivers and everybody having that, that focus around how do we treat everybody uh, that we encounter as a consumer that has a choice in where they go, because the reality is they do. And so that has been our focus and how we are changing our system to be more consumer centric and oriented about serving patients on their terms and their needs where they want to be served versus where we want them to be served. And some may say, you know, with the thinking, well, this is how we've always done it. And healthcare is different. It's complex. It's not like retail. We can't be like Amazon. So kind of thinking in terms of that mindset where you start to hear things like that, what can we do? Is there anything we can do about it to be more consumer focused? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And we, I believe, you know, as an industry have had this excuse mentality that we're, we're, we're very highly regulated. We can't do certain things because of the, the paperwork restrictions and HIPAA and all these, these things that we have to comply with. And that's right, we have to comply with that. But there are workarounds. The technology that we all carry around with us each and every day in our pockets has more computing power than the desktops that we used to have 20 years ago, but yet we're still acting in healthcare like we're a 20, year old, a 20 years ago old, old company. We have so many opportunities in this business to transform the way in which we operate and still meet the regulatory processes and licensure requirements that we have to deal with. Um, I have, again, I can control pretty much my whole life on this device. I can control my bank account, my home, my car, my thermostats. Um, but, but most people, I would say, are, are pretty attached to their bank accounts. And if I trust that on here, I'm pretty sure that we can figure out how to keep information private and secure at the same time. We do it every day. We have electronic records. We have portals. We just haven't continued to extend it with that consumer mindset. So taking that technology, taking that mindset, like you said, and really incorporating it into what we do for our patients, that'll change things for people that are really powering those processes. So in terms of culture, what role does culture play in what you're thinking of in terms of consumerism? 
Cult culture is the key. I mean, at the end of the day, we're only as strong as our team and our people. So we spend a lot of time at Ardent thinking about culture, um, curating that culture, and, and thinking about how do we continue to provide opportunities to create a sense of belonging. Our Diversity and Inclusion Council is very focused on making sure that everybody that works with us, regardless of their role or position, feels like this is a place where they belong and they can grow and thrive in their careers. Our Women at Arden program is focusing on developing our people and giving them opportunities to learn and grow personally and professionally through their career journey. Our Arden Cares Foundation is, talking to, is, is designed to help our, our team members that are in need. Um, everybody is going through something in the background and oftentimes uh, people don't like to bring those things to work, but the reality is they come to work whether we want them to or not. And so, We've had unfortunate uh, issues where we've had employees lose their homes to a tornado or a flood. Uh, we've had, um, unfortunately, we've had deaths amongst our team members as a result of them putting their lives on the line treating patients with COVID and, and losing their lives at the same time. Being able to help their families cope with these disasters and provide funds, all of these things are things that we do to try to promote a culture where people belong and where they feel that they have the opportunity to give their best and continue to grow within this, the organization. So culture is key to everything that we do. It's critically important. Is it the end all be all? What can you do beyond culture to continue moving forward the direction that you're thinking? Yeah, I mean, it starts with people, but we have to provide processes and opportunities for them to, to work at their best. Um, the broken processes that, that I was talking about earlier are things that they have to deal with each and every day. So we, we know that if we listen to our people, we're going to get good feedback. We're going to be able to help them to um, provide that care experience that our patients want and that they want to give. So we're investing in technology heavily um, to provide that consumer focus experience. Uh, everything from the front end of the visit of how we schedule, how do we set up appointments, how do we access new uh, providers of care, to the in-room experience when patients are, are with us in the inpatient environment, how do we help make our caregivers, um, give them the ability to function at the top of their license, how can we implement technology into the bedside to help monitor vital signs or take vital signs and give the caregivers the opportunity to really see what's going on with the patient instead of just doing the manual aspects of obtaining that data to begin with. Um, that's going to free up um, resources so that we can have people working at the top of their license and providing that care that the patients are looking for. And then even beyond, um, how do we engage with patients? Everything from bills, um, you know, my journey, I'm still getting bills in the mail from seven months ago and trying to figure out who all these people were that saw me and touched me and did something um, and, and still trying to get all these things reconciled. It's a confusing process. Uh, but through technology, we believe we can provide easy to read statements, easy to ways uh, to, for, for patients to pay their bills, um, and then to engage with us for follow-up care. Um, scheduling telehealth is one thing, but having on-demand video visits are what people really want and need. We are pil piloting this in a number of our markets right now because if we think about it, when I call and look for something, I, you know, if, if I'm going on my phone and looking at Amazon, it's because I want to buy something today. It's not two weeks from now or three weeks from now, it's today. Uh, but in healthcare, we have this mentality of we're sick, we want care, we call, and we're told to wait. And so on demand video visits is something that patients should have. We don't have to get in your car and drive to an ER or urgent care center. We can take care of you right there, or at least get you connected to the right levels of care uh, that you may need beyond that. So, those are the things that we're focusing on in terms of how do we bring technology to enable the, the care experience for our patients, but also ease the burden of caring for patients for our, provi for our providers. Yeah, my mother is being, you know, she's exactly in that position in terms of needing to see a specialist, but, you know, has to get that, you know, referral from primary care. Um, so definitely applicable to all of us, really. Um, there's a quote by Jeff Bezos that you really like about being obsessed with the consumer. You've talked about the applications in healthcare. So kind of bringing this back in full circle with our people, our process, and technology. What does this quote really mean to you? Yeah, I, I love the quote because it's just hits squarely where I think uh, we need to be as an industry in healthcare, and that is having that customer obsession, that consumer obsession. But if we think about it in healthcare, that's really not where we've been. It, again, it's been defending the status quo of what we've had um, and trying to protect what we've we've been through. Um, I think COVID has been a great. Um, liberator for us to think about things differently in terms of how the world can change and, and how quickly really the industry did adapt 
um, with, with very short notice. We are capable of doing big things. We are capable of changing, but yet I hear so many people aching to get back to the way it was uh, instead of embracing the opportunity and the new reality we have in front of us. And I think companies like Amazon or CVS or Walmart, all of these, quote, disruptive companies that are coming into our industry saying it can be better and we know how to deliver better care is a great opportunity um, from a consumer perspective. But at the end of the day, a lot of these companies and niche providers or competitors that are coming in are, are really point solutions. And so rarely does a patient come in and have one issue that can be solved. And if you're really good at providing urgent care, if you're really good at providing lab tests or what have you, um, that's, that's great. It's easy access. It's what the patient wants. It's comfortable. It's convenient. Um, those are the things that we should be striving for. But at the end of the day, we're not connecting the dots. You know, my care journey, I had a, an inpatient stay, an outpatient uh, uh, ASC, a procedure, physical therapy, and none of those providers were linked together at the end of the day. So who is providing that, that, that common backbone for the patient experience and navigating the care journey? That's where I think we as, as healthcare providers have the opportunity. We have the trust of our patients, we have the brand, we have the, the exposure. We just have to be that trust network. And whether we are providing the care ourselves, partnering with somebody else to deliver it, um, or, or outsourcing that, we have to be able to connect the dots. And I think technology is going to be that opportunity for us to really regain um, the opportunity to be that consumer focused system if we really are truly embracing it as uh, the, the quote suggests. And it really helps us get back to our core, which is what you say very simply, we're people caring for people. Because at the end of the day, that's why caregivers chose this profession. They care and they want to help. They don't want to have to be burdened by these processes and broken technology, like you've said. Exactly. It's all about the people. And it's, it's people first. It's not patients. It's not employees. It's people. We're all in this together. Um, our people are trying to care for those that are, are coming to us in their time of need. And as long as we keep them at the front and center of everything that we're doing, we are going to make a positive impact and we can change the way in which healthcare is delivered in this country. All right. Thank you, Marty. This is a great you, time Amanda. at Ardent. Thank you, Amanda. Great to be here. Thank you, everybody.